My name is Mark Richards. I'm the Executive Dean for the College of Letters and Science, but today I am the Dean for Mathematical and Physical Sciences. Uh, and uh, we are using this wonderful occasion to launch a new program for the Mathematical, Physical, and Computer Sciences at Berkeley called the Berkeley Science Network. Yeah. <laughs> I can see we're getting the word out. Um, the, the goal of this program is to set an extremely high bar that's already very high at UC Berkeley for uh, nurturing and promoting the careers of, of underrepresented minority students at all levels and faculty as well and uh, to achieve the diversity goals of, of the university and we all know that the, these goals are particularly difficult and challenging in the mathematical, physical, and computer sciences. And we have decided to take this head on uh, with a vertically and horizontally integrated mentoring program that is vertically integrated across all career levels from the high school. Any SMASH students here today? Um, they're, they're all in school. <laughs> That's right. Um, through, through, through the faculty, uh, graduate students, postdocs, et cetera and certainly undergraduates, and also integrating across all the scientific fields uh, in this area, effectively uh, achieving the kind of critical mass that we know is required to be effective uh, in just the kinds of subjects that uh, Professor Steele is going to be addressing uh, today. Um, we also, this is also a research project. We're trying to understand better uh, the, the uh, interventions that we are implementing and the methods that we're uh, using. And hopefully at the end of a few years, we'll have a much better idea of how to, how to, how to do this job better. I want to acknowledge just a few people before uh, introducing Professor Steele. Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Colette Pat and Ira Young, uh, the co-directors of this program. <laughs> We, we have done an enormous amount of work on behalf of, of diversity in, in the physical sciences at, at Berkeley and are, uh, have, have put a lot of effort into, into making this day happen as well. I also want to uh, acknowledge our sponsors. Uh, among our chief sponsors, Mitchell Kapoor and Frida Klein. If they may stand up, please, uh, from the... And <laughs> who, who have a lot going on in their lives, but a lot of their lives are dedicated to promoting diversity, especially in the sciences, and, and it's been a, an enormously rewarding experience as my, in my career as dean to be, have the privilege of working with them. Thank you so much. I also want to introduce Jarvis Sulser, who is the director of the CEO, I believe, of the Level Playing Field Institute. And there are many Berkeley dignitaries here, but I have to acknowledge the ones above my pay grade for certain. Um, so, uh, Gabor Basri, the Vice Chancellor for Equity and Inclusion. And Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost George Breslauer here as well. When we were beginning to design the Berkeley Science Network program, which frankly is kind of our moonshot at what we think is the best implementation of, of current social science research and achieving diversity goals in the sciences, I was given this book, Whistling Vivaldi. Many of you have already received copies of this remarkable book. And having spent a few years as dean already beating my head against the wall in frustration as many with the lack of progress or the frustrating rate of prog progress that we've made in what often are called the hard sciences in areas of diversity, both racial and gender diversity, I found this book an unbelievable breath of fresh air, uh, realizing that many of the ideas and the, the interventions that we have been practicing, some of which fall under the, the, the loose umbrella of affirmative action, um, had, had become a bit stale and outdated and that there was hope and there was promise and there, were, there was sound research to lead us forward. And, and I'm just absolutely thrilled today that we've been able to convince Professor Claude Steele to join us for most of the day, in fact, uh, here at Berkeley to launch this program. Professor Steele has been perhaps the most conspicuous and prominent leader in, in the area of, of identity uh, issues and, and stereotype threat in particular, which I believe is a phrase that he and his group actually coined. 
Uh, Claude Steele is the dean for the school of, at the School of Education at Stanford, although his, in a previous life he was a professor of psychology at Stanford. Uh, and prior to uh, seeing the light and returning to the West Coast, he was the provost at Columbia University. And he served on the faculty at the University of Michigan, University of Washington. His degrees are from Hiram College and also from a PhD from Ohio State University. He has many honorary degrees, including from the University of Michigan, University of Chicago, Yale University, Princeton University, and University of Maryland. Uh, his list of awards is, is kind of astonishing, and if I actually read them all off, he would have little time to speak here. But he's a member of the Nas both the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Education, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Philosophical Society. Um, his research uh, has spanned many different aspects of social psychology during his career, but he's particularly focused on the psychological experience of the individual and on the experience of threats to the self and the consequences of those threats. Just, just a little personal note again, as I was mentioning, this, this book had a profound influence over my thinking and Colette Pat's thinking, and I believe the Level Playing Field Institute, this research has been a profound influence in directing how we should approach and how we can improve, improve upon what we're doing, in, in particularly in the mathematical and physical sciences. And there are many different ways of thinking of this, but in, in my own way of thinking, we grow up with the mythology that I would characterize as surrounding the ideas of innate ability. Uh, particularly, this is particularly prevalent in the sciences. And yes, there are people have various abilities and they should always seek to maximize those abilities. But there is also, your performance can also have very much to do with your psychological state. That is the, the preparations, the signals that you're receiving and how you perceive yourself, whether you feel like you belong or not in a particular group of individuals or a particular profession. And Professor Steele's research, again, has led the way in helping us understand how to mitigate the harmful effects of, of stereotype, often stereotypes related to histories that none of us are really to blame for, but which we all inherit and must in some way encounter at various times in our lives. So without further ado, let me introduce from Stanford, Professor Claude Steele. We will have a chance for questions afterward. Professor Steele. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think if I stand out here, I can be heard. The microphone. Great. Uh, well, uh, I was just thinking the word cutting edge is a, often a cliche, but I can't think of a better word than, to, than that to describe this, the Berkeley uh, Science Network. I just think it's a really cool idea. <laughs> I want to steal it. <laughs> uh, I, 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 first, it reflects a great uh, awareness that uh, some of the, the issues that we face in the sciences and, and diversifying the sciences, that they can be uh, dealt with and, and that simple institutional strategies can be a huge help. Uh, and then I think the particular strategy that you guys are trying to stress on ment mentoring and, and building a relationships between students and faculty is just uh, a, a really ingenious idea and I think it will uh, harness a lot of the, the things that I'm going to talk about uh, uh, today. So I may be a biased perceiver of all this, but I think it's a great idea. Uh, I've had a great day uh, uh, visiting you guys and wish you the best of luck, and I'm going to keep track of how things go. <laughs> um, so I, I'm uh, just going to try to convince you that uh, this social psychological phenomenon of stereotype threat and social identity threat maybe social image threat more gener generally, that this is an important phenomenon, that uh, it isn't just something that uh, is ephemeral and, and you can just push through and ignore, uh, that it affects uh, many important decisions that we make about who we know, where we live, what careers we're going to have, uh, that it affects really important performances, uh, how we do in school, how we do in sports, uh, that it has a whole bunch of important, significant consequences. But I don't want to be depressing <laughs> uh, and uh, leave with the impression that uh, these processes are all determinative, all determinative and that there's nothing you can do or that nothing that people are already doing to get past them. I, uh, I, I think there are. And so uh, I want to stress both that dimension of, of, of the work and, uh, and I want to get to the 
the, the remedies, the sets of skills that I think both institutions and individuals can develop to deal with these uh, kinds of threats. But I do think they're real. I do think uh, as the United States goes forward, we're going to become uh, an increasingly diverse society. Uh, I think the last election gave us some uh, preview of, of, of that and the, the complexity we're going to be ushered into. And I think these issues, these challenges, uh, are, are uh, most fundamental. It's hard to think of more important challenges than, than being successful at this, using all of our magnificent population to, to uh, uh, our betterment. So uh, I think these are important uh, issues. They're not just marginal issues, and that's going to be one of the, the things that, that I talk about. So I, I, that's, again, why I ratify the, the, the Science Network, is that these are really some big issues, not just marginal issues, in, 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 uh, certainly in higher education. Um, well, the other sub-theme I hope you uh, pick up is that the ideas you're about to hear about or have maybe read about, uh, as I try to stress in that book, uh, none of them are the ideas we started with. They all came from, uh, uh, we, we started with very different ideas. I'm embarrassed to even say some of the ideas we started with, uh, but we were led to these ideas by uh, a kind of painstaking uh, ad adherence to the, to the data, and I, I hope to give you some sense of just how science works, the evolving interaction with data and evidence, and how they, the, your ideas, your theories change in, in, in that respect. Uh, I won't make this a big scientific talk. There's not going to be a lot of data slides, and given our PowerPoint situation, there's not going to be any data slides. <laughs> Uh, I did have a couple of very nice uh, videos, that, uh, but I'll, you'll have to just take my verbal description of them at this, uh, uh, at this point. Uh, that's all I was going to do is show three videos, so we're not going to miss too much with, with uh, uh, the PowerPoint here. So uh, I have three sections. One is I'm going to talk about the problem that uh, got us started, uh, they, that made us think there was something important to solve and that a psychology might be useful in solving it. Then I'll talk about the phenomenon of stereotype threat, social identity threat, uh, try to give you some sense of it, the tissue of it, how it comes together, and then I'll, I'll get into uh, a discussion of remedies. So that's the, the general order of things. Uh, the phenomenon is very simply stated, that for groups whose abilities are negatively stereotyped in the larger society, when they're performing in areas where those stereotypes are, are relevant, they tend to underperform there even when their preparation, skills, and talents are the same. Even when there's no ability for, there's no differences in talents or uh, uh, preparation or knowledge base. Uh, in those areas where uh, a group is negatively stereotyped, there still seems to be, especially when you're performing really hard work in that area, sort of at the frontier of one's skills, there seems to be this, this mysterious underperformance. I first saw this, as I talk about in the book, when when um, at the University of Michigan, I saw a graph of the grade point averages of Michigan students graphed out as a function of the SAT score they had when they entered Michigan. And what you saw was that in general, um, it wasn't a big slope to this line, just a gradual slope, but that as the student entered, students who entered with higher SAT scores tended to get higher grades in Michigan, in general. But the graph also broke out a data line separately for African American students in Michigan. And what, was, what I saw there was the beginning of this puzzle that at every level of SAT score, African American students were getting lower grades than other students at Michigan. And that was the puzzle. Why would that be? They have. You've got, you're talking about kids with 1550 SAT scores using the old scale. Uh, why would there be a consistent over big samples, underperformance there. Within weeks, we found out the same thing was true for women in advanced math courses at uh, Michigan. That uh, in the advanced math courses, not the entry level, there was this mysterious underperformance. Women with the same SAT scores, same prior courses, coursework, were getting lower grades than men in those situations. Um, then we found that, of course, that this is almost lawful in American society. I think it's almost lawful all over the world in one form or another, but the way I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk about the American 
picture of this phenomenon. Uh, but it, it happens everywhere. You can almost go into any ident identity integrated situation, the law school at Harvard, the med school at Stanford, the uh, third grade ca classroom down the street, and you will see this underperformance uh, phenomenon. And it's mysterious. The thing that, that the prior beliefs that, that it challenged for me is that I thought if you got preparation exactly the same, there's so many factors, st structural, economic, historical factors, that uh, a distribute educational economic uh, opportunity so unequally in society that you would expect differences in skill to still exist among students who are still strong enough to get into a good university like the University of Michigan. There still might be that. But when you've equated for those differences and you still find a difference, that's the, the mystery. Stereotype threat after years of wandering in the wilderness <laughs> is our answer to what's causing that in biggest part. I'm not completely sure that stereotype threat is the entire explanation. Uh, I don't know if I can ever get to that level of complete confidence about it, but I think it's a big part of the story of, of, of where that's happening. And the idea there is pretty straightforward, that if you're a member of a group whose, whose abilities are negatively stereotyped, uh, then every time you're, and, and you really care about performing well in that domain, when you're performing in that domain, you know that you could be possibly, especially if you experience some frustration, you could be seen or treated in terms of that stereotype. And if that, uh, that you know, if that's upsetting to you, then you, you could, you're, it could injure your performance right there. And it could also constitute something you, you think you're, you worry about facing as you go forward in that whole domain. How long am I going to have to deal with this vague sense of discomfort in, in, in this situation? So that's, that's the, uh, the, the story in a, in, a, in a nutshell, is that that's where the, 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 the concept eventually evolved, was that it seemed to happen in reaction to uh, stereotypes. Um, let me give you a formal definition. Uh, I, I want to uh, uh, stress that though we discovered stereotype threat in an effort to explain this particular phenomenon, that stereotype threat itself is a very general phenomenon. Everybody experiences it in one form or another, and I think almost on a daily basis it happens. Uh, there's no identity that you have that doesn't have a negative stereotype about it. <laughs> and so when you're in a situation where that negative stereotype applies, and if you care about it, you could feel a version of the stereotype threat. You could feel that. Uh, I think, uh, uh, well, I'll talk about this in a minute. I think this is one way that our history gets transported into our present lives is through these lingering stereotypes and the kind of pressures they put on us uh, as, as individuals. And if you just want to get some s almost visceral sense of what stereotype threat is like, just think of any situation you've been in where based on something about you, you had to worry that maybe people we're not going to think you do well. And it's in a situation that's important to you. That's the, the general gist of it. To show the generality, I was going to show a film clip uh, about a, a form of stereotype threat that's kind of unusual, just to illustrate its generality. And I was going to show a clip about, uh, how, I, I, is there a situation where a white guy is going to experience some stereotype threat uh, about their intellectual ability? Is there some domain in life where, uh, uh, in, in, in uh, American society, where a white guy might feel kind of negatively stereotyped with regard to some kind of intellectual uh, uh, ability, especially in relation to African Americans? And there is such a domain, rapping. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, a, it's a black creation, a black, black art form, and it's a hard intellectual uh, thing, you know, the, the, the contest is one rapper, come, two rappers come out, they flip a coin, one guy has to go first, his job is to level horrifying insults at the other uh, <laughs> rapper, uh, but he has to kind of, just seeing who that other rapper is, he has to make up these insults on the spot, and he has to do it in rhyme, and he has to do it in time, and he has to do it in an audience that's, you know, kind of pulsing to this, to this beat. And then this, the poor second rapper, 
<laughs> he has to, when his turn comes, he has to respond and defend himself, having heard all the charges leveled against him. He has to make up some defenses of himself. He has to do it in rhyme, and he has to do it in time, and he has to do it in a, again in front of this audience that's pulsing and screaming at him and evaluating every turn of phrase. So it's a tough uh, intellectual performance to, to do. I don't think I'd have the guts to do it for a second. Um, so what I was going to show you is the first few minutes of the movie Eight Mile, which is the story <laughs> of Eminem, <laughs> the famous white rapper. Uh, and it starts out with, uh, you know, his ma a, a, a kind of massive failure on his part. He's backstage, he's throwing up, he's nervous. Uh, he's seen as illegitimate. That's an important part of this. They, they don't want to let him on stage. They can't believe he's actually going to try to, to, to uh, a rap. Uh, they call him white with a mic, stereotype. He gets on stage. The other rapper is like really haranguing these horrible charges against him and, and in beautiful time and, you know, just got the whole crowd kind of moving. And then the mic goes to him. He picks up the mic. He tries to get into the groove. Terror happens. You could just, his eyes just sort of glaze over with terror. He stands there for a couple of minutes and has to hand the mic and walk off. And the rest of the movie is kind of how does Eminem sort of become Eminem? How does he get past this, this situation? Which is, you know, there are probably other components to it, but stereotype threat is a real big component to it. And the beauty of this clip is that his opponent is like leveling racial stereotypes at him just in an explicit and mean-spirited way. <laughs> so you get to see kind of how this, this whole thing uh, comes together. And what, what, it, what it does to a person, how you, you're, you're basically in a state where you're, you're vigilant to threat at the same time you're trying to cope with the real situation. That's how it starts to, to have its interfering effects. It, you're, it forces you into a multitasking situation. Because now you're, in addition to doing whatever it is, the, the manifest task in the situation, now you're coping with, how am I being seen here? And is what I just did, is that going to make me be seen like this more? Is what they say true? Uh, can I just disprove this thing right now? If I, so all kinds of internal dialogues that are going on and taking up cognitive resources at the same time that you're trying to do the, the task. And that's where it starts to have its, its uh, interfering and distressing uh, uh, component to it. Well, the, the one big question then is, is, does this kind of threat go to school? Does this happen in school? Could this be significant? The, the second clip I was going to show is a clip I bet a lot of you have, have seen. And it, it comes from the famous blue-eyed, brown-eyed uh, uh, study that uh, it, it was actually done for the first time the day after Martin Luther King was killed in 1968 by Jane Elliott, a school teacher in Riceville, Iowa, who wanted to give her students an experience that would give them some idea of what, what Martin Luther King's uh, life was about and so on, so she de decides to sort of divide the room into blue-eyed and brown-eyed kids and to uh, build a sort of stigma based on eye color in that situation so they'll know, and get some sense of what, what discrimination and prejudice is like. And so she stays up all night and she makes little collars that are either blue or brown and the next day when school begins she uh, has them, they come into the classroom and she has the brown-eyed students put on a brown collar and she stands in front of the classroom and says, uh, brown-eyed people are not as smart as blue-eyed people, and, and they don't smell that good. And uh, they don't play fair. And um, I think they should get up and go to the back of the classroom. And you, the camera follows them in this famous ABC News reenactment of this situation. You see these kids just like traumatized by this. And, they, and at recess, they're huddling in the corner. They, they just don't know what to do. They're stunned by this situation. And the only fairness is that the next day she comes back and she does the same thing to the blue-eyed students. She has them wear a blue collar and she says the same thing. Blue-eyed students are not very smart and they don't smell that well and uh, they're not good and they're not fair and so they should sit in the back of the class and they get up and go to the back. Same thing happens. Well you can see the whole history of this experiment. This could never be done in modern life, <laughs> thank goodness. <laughs> uh, 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 and you don't need to because it's, it's been reacting. And you can see it on YouTube, the whole history of this uh, thing. And Jane Elliott's still out there talking about this uh, these many years later. Um, 
But there's a side scene in the, in the initial documentary where uh, the kids are pulled together in groups, little small groups, and they're working through a problem pack, and she is keeping track of how fast they work through the, the problem pack. And what you see in dramatic and kind of painful way is that the kids with the collars are taking forever to get through the problem pack. And then when they take the collars off the next day, they zoom through the problem pack. And she asked them on, on the screen, why is it that this is the case? Why, why are you so slow today? And they say, well, I'm thinking about these. Just tugging on their collars. Well, that's a very powerful manipulation of, of identity and, and a, a, an implementation of a stigma in a, a situation. Uh, a more straightforward question is, could, it, could, could, could real identities, negatively stereotyped identities in real life constitute something comparable to that in, in uh, everyday classrooms from K through 24? Could uh, identities have that similar kind of an effect if, if in the larger society the identities uh, are negatively stereotyped with regard to ability? Could that really be as powerful. I mean, nobody's having to wear a collar and there's nobody standing in front of the classroom saying that kind of thing. So could these other identities really be so, uh, so powerful? That's the, uh, the basic question. Well, the first experiment that we did to get at this is in some ways, I think, the most illustrative. And uh, it certainly is the one that gave us the most confidence about uh, this, that this kind of, a, of an experience could translate, have implications for performance and success in a, a classroom. Uh, it was very simple. We got University of Michigan sophomores uh, who were really good in math, men and women, and uh, we carefully matched them for their prior test scores, their grades, their commitment to math, personal goals, professional aspirations, all these things. So we had two groups here that were like head to head in math, ability and motivation. We brought them in one at a time into the laboratory and we gave them a really mean math test, a half hour section of the graduate record exam you take if you're a math major, not the general quantitative section. So this, is, this is mean. And uh, <laughs> you know, it's going to cause frustration. But these are people that care about and are good at math. They care about it and they're really good at it. Uh, so for me, I would just give up in that situation. For them, this is what they're off on. So uh, our idea was that this experience would be qualitatively different for the women than for the men. For the men, as they experienced that frustration, there would be a sense of frustration and maybe some worry that they weren't as good at math as they thought they were. That could be distressing and upsetting. Uh, but they wouldn't have any worry beyond that. Whereas women in this situation, in addition to those worries, they would also have the worry that, is what they say about women in math ability, is that, is that true? Or will I, be, will, will I be seen as confirming that? Or what is, Larry Summers said something about that? Uh, uh, you know, it, uh, am I off on the wrong track? And, uh, no, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat this thing. I'm going to bear down and beat this thing. Well, all the time you're having that dialogue, there's the test and the clock is going, and you're <laughs> So indeed, their performance goes down. But somebody who, who believes the Larry Summers story could uh, say, well, that's exactly what, what you'd expect, is that it's a difficult math. Didn't I say, Larry Summers' exact quote was, uh, perhaps women lack the ability at the high end so if you give them a high-end test, a hard test, maybe you're just tapping into that fundamentally biological difference. So to separate our explanation from that explanation required an experiment. And it took us a long, painful time to come up with a simple way to redo the experiment, but this time take the stereotype threat out of the, situ the testing situation. That's what we had to do. And we, if you could do that, then, and the, the, the thing that had repressed their performance in the first place was stereotype threat, and you took the stereotype threat out, then their performance should go up. But if you, was, Larry Summers was correct, and you took the stereotype threat out of the situation and it was really due to biological differences, their performance would just stay down there. 
So uh, what was painful is that we've gotten ourselves into a situation that you try to avoid most of your lives is where some experiment is going to really shed light on your basic beliefs and assumptions about the, about the world. And, and we, oh, you know, it was stressful in that situation. So thank God it came out the right way for all kinds of, of reasons. <laughs> Um, and uh, what we did to relieve the threat in this situation is just before they sat down to take the test, we told them, look, um, you may have heard that women don't do as well on difficult standardized math tests as men. You might have heard that, but that is not true for this particular test you're taking today. The test you're taking today, women always do as well as men. There's no difference. <laughs> the, su the subtext is anything that happens to you on this test doesn't say anything about your being a woman. You could find out that you as an individual are not as good as you thought about math. You might find that out. But you're not going to find out that you're not good at math because you're a woman, which I can just say as an aside here. That's one of the most devastating things that can ever happen to a person is to think that you're being treated on, or, or that you're performing on the basis of some kind of categorical limitation or so. That is much better to take the blame oneself than to think that's what's driving it. So uh, when we did that instruction, the women performed just the same as the men in that situation. And oh, there was a big... <laughs> Our blood pressures went, went down. We tried it with race, same thing. Same, another group whose abilities are negatively stereotyped, intellectual abilities are negatively stereotyped in the broader society. Uh, we gave them, uh, I'm gonna tell you about a study we didn't do, but it's better than the ones we did, so I'll tell you about this one. Uh, they, we, we gave them a, a, an IQ test, the Raven's Progressive Matrices IQ test. It's a big square with a design on it. There's five little squares. You have to pick which of those little squares has the design that's in the big square. That's all you got to do. And as you go from item to item, you're easy, you're cruising. Then you start to get hard, and then you start to get really hard, causing frustration. And when they cause frustration, that's the thing that makes that stereotype out there in our particular society relevant as a personal interpretation of what's going on that maybe what they, eat, this is an IQ, this, and I'm not, this is, now you've got this whole dialogue going on, right, in your head, in addition to trying to figure out these stupid designs. So, uh, indeed, black students perform a standard deviation worse than white students. That is exactly the size of the IQ gap between whites and blacks in the general population. So here in the laboratory, they are re replicating exactly the pattern that happens in the real world. Uh, as, a, as a person, you're really sad about that, to find that finding there. As a scientist, you're kind of happy because you now have control over it, and you can begin to see what drives it. And you remember, our hypothesis is that this isn't what the stereotype says, the biological story. It's stereotype threat, and that if we can get the stereotype threat out of this situation, their performance will go up and match that of white students in this situation. So the way we got the stereotype threat out of that testing situation, the way these, these authors did, is very straightforward. They just told them in the, t in the condition that they didn't want stereotype threat in, gave them the same test, but this time they said, it's not a test, this is just a puzzle. We're studying a puzzle today. This has nothing to do with cognitive abilities, can't measure those at all. This is just a puzzle. We want you to do the best you can. We want you to have fun. And when you have fun, when you're doing a puzzle, you know, frustration is like what you're after. <laughs> That's what you want. So in that situation, you're not put off by it. It doesn't signal anything heavy. There's no emotion. There's no second order reaction to it. And under that instruction, white and black students perform exactly the same on this IQ test, which is a nonverbal IQ test. It's the gold standard of IQ tests in the United States, to the extent that you believe there can be a test that tests something like IQ. We'll save that discussion for later. <laughs> but at any rate, it wipes out the difference. So, you know, this, this happens in a variety of, of uh, uh, ways. Um, you want to put uh, white guys under intellectual stereotype threat. You give them a difficult demanding. We did this with the engineering graduate students at Stanford. We gave them a very difficult math test and told them just before they took the test, here we want you to do the best you can. This is a test on which Asians tend to do better than whites. Just here, do the test. <laughs> <laughs> 
So now every, every time they experience a frustration, you know, it could signal that they're on the downside of somebody else's positive, you know, talent. And that signal, what am I confirming here? And it cre creates the same distraction. Uh, so, I, you know, what, what, what one important thing to, to, to say, to, to underline at this point, I, I, I mentioned it early, is that, earlier, is that I think this is how history lives with us in the present, that the stereotypes bring the, sort of export the history of our society into the present and create these kind of conflicts for us. Uh, a, a, a white stereotype threat, it was, it, probably, it was inevitable that if we did these experiments there, we'd also get to a white ex form of stereotype threat. We had white, white guys at uh, Stanford come into the laboratory and they were going to have a conversation with two other students. And they saw pictures of the two students. And in one case, it was two white guys. In the other case, it was two black guys. And they find out that they're going to talk about in this conversation either love and relationships, which is kind of easy to talk about, or they're going to talk about racial profiling. <laughs> so they're going to talk about either to two black guys or two white guys, either about love and relationships, or they're going to talk about racial profiling. And then we say, look, I'm going to go down the hall. I'm going to get your two uh, conversation partners. Uh, would you mind, while I'm gone, arranging the three chairs for this conversation? And as soon as they arrange the three chairs, you know, the experiment's over. <laughs> You're trying to see how they space themselves in preparation for one of these conversations. And you could predict the results that uh, when they're going to talk to two white guys about uh, anything, or they're going to talk to two black guys about love and relationships, they put the three chairs very close together. But when they are going to talk to two black guys about racial profiling, two strangers, black guys, about racial profiling, they put the two black guys over here and themselves over here. <laughs> There's a big, a big distance starts to enter into the situation. What's that, what's that distance about? Well, it's, they don't want to confirm the stereotype that, uh, they don't want to get in a conversation with two, two black guys and risk confirming a stereotype that they're racist or that they're racially insensitive or unknowing. And interestingly, the, we had independent measures of how prejudiced they were. They, they, they weren't very prejudiced on the absolute scale. But the, the, the least president, pre prejudiced they, they were, the farther they sat themselves away from the two black guys in that condition, the least prejudiced. It's just like the women in math. It's the women in, who are the best, most motivated math students who show the effect of the, 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 bet, the, the most strongest. One way you can protect yourself against the stereotype about your group is not to care about the domain where the, where the stereotype applies. So in the case of interracial re relations like that, if you don't care much about that domain, then you, just not, you don't feel the same risk there. But if you do care about it and you're invested in seeing yourself in a certain way, the risk of being seen this other way that this situation poses is the threat. So when you play this out across society and you try to interpret what the intergroup dynamics are, how it is that history actually visits our lives on a daily basis and institutions and, and the like, uh, is, it, is it stereotype threat or is it all sort of old-fashioned prejudice? We were in that experiment sort of pitting the two things against each other. And here's some evidence that a lot of what happens is just the, 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 the self-consciousness that our history has left us with, our unresolved history has left us with these things. And the other dimension to stress is that this is an ongoing kind of uh, a threat. You just don't sort of uh, disprove it in one situation and then it's out of your life. Uh, it reemerges because you're now in a different, you're, you're, you maybe go from the seventh grade to the eighth grade and now you have to kind of disprove that stereotype all over again. It's not in the person's head as a vulnerability, a low self-esteem or a low view about their group or a low sense about their own abilities. It's not there. Remember, the effect is strongest among precisely the people who have the strongest abilities, who have the strongest ambition and expectations uh, for, for themselves. So I'm a psychologist. Again, I believed it was there, but it didn't seem to be there because we couldn't get that effect in, we only got that effect in the members of the group who were the vanguard of the group, who were, had the strongest feelings there. So uh, what does make it worse and not so bad? Um, eventually we came to a very simple idea that's sort of right in front of us cues in a situation. 
that tell you or suggest that you might be seen in terms of this stereotype, that you might have to deal with that. Uh, you know, it's like a, a snake in the house. Snake's in the house. You're trying to watch the football game. <laughs> you, you can't really just kind of flop down on the couch because, uh, what's that movement over there? Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> How big is that snake? Uh, uh, <laughs> How bad is it? Is it, is it? Am I going to ever get that snake out of the house? Uh, it's just that kind, of, that, that kind of dialogue. And it's brought to bear by the cues that suggest its presence. Uh, I use the Sandra Day O'Connor story in the, in the book. Uh, she was asked by Nina Totenberg about her autobiography. Uh, what was it like to be the first woman on the Supreme Court? And she said, without any latency, it was asphyxiating. It was asphyxiating. Everywhere I went, the press followed me up the steps of my house into restaurants. Every time I did, there was a decision, they ruthlessly evaluated my intelligence, my wisdom, whether I was feminist, whether I was not feminist enough. I, I was just hounded as the only woman. Well, what was it like when Ruth Bader Ginsburg got there? Everything changed. Everything completely changed with this other woman on the Supreme Court. It just didn't make sense to ask the same kind of questions about two women, women that, it ma that it made to ask about one woman. And so pretty soon the press just kind of like forgot about that issue. And they kind of lived uh, with, you know, as normal members of the Supreme Court. Uh, I heard this story, as I described in the book, about a month before the Supreme Court uh, decision. This was in 2003, before the Supreme Court decisions were going to be announced. Michigan was pressing the case. And I thought I knew for sure how it was going to turn out because... Sandra Day O'Connor was the deciding justice in that case. The Michigan defense was that critical mass, critical mass was important, and that without critical mass, uh, you would put minority students under just too much identity pressure in that situation in, 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 in going to college to not be a distracting, troubling part of their experience, and that we just couldn't do that. And so that was the defense uh, that Michigan offered. And I just felt that uh, I knew how Sandra Day O'Connor as the deciding justice was going to go because she would been on the court with critical mass and she'd been on the court without critical mass and she knew experientially that there was a difference and some of the other justices just wouldn't know that. They would have to get to that idea by the numbers, by a logical argument and that's very different than seeing the experience in your own life where that, that situational cue, the numbers of others there, could make uh, a significant difference to you. So she did, and she's not of that political, ideological <laughs> persuasion, but she'd had that experience, which was very close at hand. Let's see what happens this year on the uh, Supreme Court in affirmative action. Well, there are other cues, I think ideological cues, uh, the valuing of diversity, I'll talk about that in, in a minute. I think as, when diversity is presented as something that is essential, to excellence as opposed to something that is in competition with excellence, as an institution embodies uh, a diversity, if it does it as sort of a marginal concession to a political value, that is a very bad cue that would make anybody uh, with that identity uh, feel like they may not belong in this situation. But if, if, if it is presented as uh, uh, this is critical to excellence, you can't have an excellent uh, I mean in any field, I feel this in any field, the, the influx of different perspectives in solving problems and moving disciplines forward is more important almost than small, certainly than small increments in skill level that you would get. So that's, one, uh, that's been an American resource is the diversity of our perspectives that we can bring to bear on solving our major challenges. So if you represent it that way, it's a very inclusive uh, ideology and it's a cue in a situation that tells somebody who's got a, a suspect identity that they're bringing something positive to the table as opposed to bringing something concessionary or being in there on a marginal basis. We've got a real lot, lot of realignment to do in our major institutions to, to correct that bias. But that's just another example of, of that. Well, remedies. Uh, what can we do? I kind of break them into uh, a, a number of uh, uh, categories, I, and I th almost think of them as sets of skills. There are skills that an institution can develop, and there are skills that uh, individuals can uh, develop. 
what institutions can do is understand certainly the, the importance of something like critical mass, uh, that people of all, all of us count. You know, I go to hear my son, who's a musician, play in a, in a club, and I'm looking, how many other gray-haired people are there in this room? <laughs> now, why am I on earth doing that? Why am I allocating any attention to that at, at, at all? What am, I, what am I looking for? Well, I, you know, I don't know, but uh, I, I think <laughs> we do it, and I think it has something to do with appraising whether or not this identity belongs here. It could be good, effective. You know, I'm going to have to deal with anything because you know, what, will people see me a certain way? We're constantly doing that. So, um, you know, that's, critical mass is a big deal. I also think, you know, as cliche-ish as it can sound, role models and existence proofs are also big deals. The fact that uh, Barack Obama is the President of the United States, uh, er nobody believes, I don't think, that that's going to completely realign racial relations and the history and the structures of race. That, you know, no, that's not going to do that. But it does mean something very different to be in a society where Barack Obama, a black man, can be the President of the United States versus being in a society where a black man cannot be the President of the United States or a woman cannot be the President of the United States. That's a different identity situation for somebody, and that's going to keep on the burner these issues. So that's what that means in some, in some sense. It is a, a, a step forward. Uh, that, that's another thing that institutions can do in their set of skills, is to focus on, on, the, on a, a conscious effort to, uh, to, to do that, to build that diversity, critical mass, this, I, these, these sort of philosophies, ideologies of diversity. For example, one pet peeve I have is that I think a general education requirement should include ethnic studies. Uh, the, fact that, <laughs> the fact that it's over there in certain pro programs and, course, and it's not seen as something that is of general value to everybody who's going to get an American education is, is to me a big signal that uh, marginalizes the identity and it fits with that whole sense you know, there are historical reasons for this, I, I get that, but I think we got to, you know, as we move forward, we got to look at these kinds of things. That kind of knowledge about uh, the people who make up this society, historically, where they came from, what happened to them, what they're, you, you got to know that to be an educated American. You, you just have to understand to be an educated American, you have to know that. And that immediately brings in everybody and says, look, this is, we're, we're included here, this is, this is us. This is ours, and that's a very different uh, sense than to have a sense that it's, that, that kind of curriculum is channeled over here for people with a specific identity or and it's only of relevance to them, the rest of us don't have to know anything about it. That's, that's, that's reinforcing another construct, construction of, of, of society. So I think that that's, uh, uh, you know, as I say, a pet uh, peeve of mine. Individually, there are, are strategies. Uh, my colleague, Carol Dweck, has got a brilliant one. Uh, it's easy. You, I think it's really true. I can spend uh, a, an hour or so defending that if, you <laughs> if you'd like me to. Uh, ability is incremental and expandable. These stereotypes allege a fixed limitation of ability. That's the allegation at the core of the, of the stereotype, that either God or your genes, as by, adult, by dint of being membership in that group, that one of those things gave you a limited, fixed, smaller amount of ability than they gave to somebody else. When, when you believe that about ability, the first sign of frustration, especially if you're in a negatively stereotyped group, the first sign of frustration is a plausible signal that you just don't belong there. So, so believing that is a fund, has a, having a, 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 an ideology about the nature of ability like that, uh, it has this kind of deterring power. So it's a very powerful thing. I have always had, for some reason or another, uh, maybe my parents helped me see the world this way. But e even when I was in graduate school or any, any point, any, any elite situation, and you hear your colleagues talking about who is smart and who's, who's really, really smart. And, uh, you know, you, I've always had the private theory that they're wrong. It's not about some God-given thing. It's about uh, uh, an expandable ability. And if you put your 10,000 hours in, you can get better at this. And you can, you got to focus, but you can get better and better. And who knows at the very top what goes on, but you can get really good at this. And 
So having that view is a, is a part of a personal toolkit that I think reduces the impact of, of these threats. Also, uh, the ability to know people across group lines is a huge thing because when you know people across group lines, you immediately find that group lines don't contain, exper explain experience as well as you think they do without that experience. If you, if you have a segregated experience, you're going to think that identities explain everything especially the bad things that happen to you if you're in a negatively stereotyped group. But if you have relationships across line, th that relaxes a little bit and isn't so foreclosing as a, 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 a perception of, the, a, a, of your experience. So that skill, going abroad, I was talking about this uh, uh, at, uh, earlier in the day, having a variety of experiences helps undermine this thing, and that's part of the toolkit, the skills that help people uh, deal with it. In general, and I'll stop with this, uh, I think we're all in a, uh, uh, we all have narratives about the circumstances that we're in and what, our, what we're like vis-a-vis -vis those circumstances and what's happening to us and are we being discriminated against or, or are we being favored. There's all, there's all kinds of things that go into that narrative. And uh, it's too much to think uh, that we're going to take the perception of threat out of that narrative altogether. Uh, that no, you're never, based on your identity, going to be under threat. That would be false consciousness or something like that. You know, I, I, I don't know if you could sustain that because sometimes you are. And that's just the way it is. And it can be in important circumstances. And there's some probability attached to that there. So you can't just advocate false consciousness. But you can a advocate a kind of realistic narrative that gives you some distance. I think I use the example in the book of my going to graduate school and, and kind of coming, a, a f having a very foreclosing narrative initially. I just, I was in the personality lockdown. I just, because I thought every, anything I would ever say could be read that way. As the only black in his whole graduate school. And those days, with the guy down the hall using the N-word, Arthur Jensen, the old Berkeley guy, showing up talking about race and IQ. You're just supposed to go out there and listen to Arthur talk about his theories as an open-minded scientist. You know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is something was, so I was in lockdown, but eventually you began to see, you know, I, my advisor seemed to believe in me. I could publish a paper and, uh, you know, I be, none of those things changed. But the narrative about what my life was going to be like, what the options were, how much freedom I had, how much room there was for me, began to expand, and you begin to feel more comfortable, like you can do this thing. And then the more you feel that way, the, uh, the less you have to allocate to vigilance and, and all those kinds of things, and worry and anxiety. And the more open you can be and the more you're like that, there's a kind of positive recursive process that happens, and you start to feel pretty damn comfortable in this situation. And people also start to know a lot more about you. And as that happens, you know that they're not seeing you in terms of those stereotypes. They're seeing you in terms of other things, maybe, but not that, that stereotype. And so you, you kind of work your way in certain circumstances out of this, this uh, uh, situation. It's a natural process. I think everybody's going through it in some walk of life or another. It's not peculiar to just minorities or just women. And so it, it, but it, it, it happens. Uh, so uh, I, I want to end with that uh, general, since we're running way out of time here, but with that general hope <laughs> that by thinking about it that way, uh, there, there's room to move. This isn't a foreclosing thing, but it is something that one has to, to deal with. And uh, I'll, I'll stop at this point, hoping that maybe we have a few minutes for some, some questions, maybe four or five minutes. Thank you. Oh, thanks, thanks, sir. So, before we have questions and before everybody filters out, I have a quick question. How many people in this room are in some way associated with departments of science or engineering here at UC Berkeley? Good. How many of you want to help us with the Berkeley Science Network? <laughs> Colette Pat is right here. Ira Young is right here. They'll take your names. We want all of you to help. We pride ourselves on being the best in science and engineering in the country. And part of that is contained in the goals of the Berkeley Science Network. And I hope you will all join us. I also want to say before we have questions and answers that I've seen both of those video clips, the, the eight mile and the brown eyes, blue eyes. And, his, and Claude's description of them were better 
than, than, <laughs> than the actual clips. They, they were terrific. So let, let's do have some questions here. And uh, if you don't mind, state your name, perhaps your affiliation at Berkeley, and, and state your question very loudly and clearly. How do you propose making that balance? For example, I've heard arguments for and against something such as Black History Month, that having it there actually has a more detrimental effect um, in terms of affecting racial stereotypes. So uh, let me get the first part of your question uh, so, again. Um, you stated one of your pet peeves was re uh, requiring um, sort of an ethnic studies course. Uh, and I was wondering what your position is on perhaps making it balanced and uh, better, for the betterment of, of taking away, stare. it's hard to word, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I think I, yeah, I maybe, I, I wouldn't, my pet peeve is not the course, so I'm gonna be clear, clear about that. I think the course, the, the study programs, without those we wouldn't have a lot of the knowledge we currently have that has been so enriching over the last 30 or 40 years. I, I'm old enough to remember when we didn't have those endeavors and, and we just didn't have a very elaborated, available uh, uh, information about that, and, uh, about those experiences in American life. And now they are much more available and much more with us. I guess I, what I was saying is that uh, I, I don't think they should be, and this is a hard uh, uh, thing to modify because you can imagine all of the, the issues involved uh, everything from academic freedom to um, I don't know what else, but uh, there, there are a variety of issues. But I'd love to see them required for everybody. Some, some sampling of, the, of that coursework would be a graduation requirement. That would be my vote. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question, and it's kind of a complicated uh, answer to that. There are several possible answers. One one answer is that when they're in high school, uh, uh, girls are about as equally represented in the advanced math courses as the men are, and so there just isn't an evidential basis for the stereotype in that in that area. We 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 went to Poland and and did women's stereotype threat studies. Uh, very soon after the first ones were done, because in Poland, that's another place where in quantitatively based fields, women are almost equally represented. And so there isn't the same evidential basis there for uh, the stereotype as there is in the United States. These stereotypes differ dramatically from, from one si society to another, coming from the different histories of these uh, societies. And in Poland, you didn't get very strong stereotype threat effects. You got stereotype threat effects around other identities, but not around uh, math. So in, in, uh, it's possible that that's one reason that they could, they were in situations where there wasn't very strong uh, stereotype threat effects and so the, the, the scores were pretty much picking up, accurately picking up their skill levels, shall we say. Uh, but it was in this other situation that we put them in where now they're performing at the frontier of their skills on a really hard test is at an elite university where this pressure comes to bear. And you, so you start to get that, the difference that we were picking up. So I, I, that's the, I think that's the simplest way. Uh, although when you look at race, race is a little different. Because in that high school era, uh, there's, there is pretty powerful stereotype threat effects on the SAT exam. So if you take a black or Latino student who's got, a, 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 let's say, a 1300, and you compare them to a white student who's, let's say, got a 1400, they may be, those two students may have essentially the same skill level, but, SAT, but the, the stereotype threat is repressing that, that uh, uh, SAT performance. You bring them into college, and, and what, what happens is that the African American student, moving now into an environment where stereotype threat is still present, 
in the schooling environment. That underperformance is still there. But there is research which has put together all the studies where of the following sort. Suppose you do something in the college environment that reduces stereotype threat effects, that reduces it to some degree. How would you expect these, these students to perform? Well, in that situation, and with just very minor efforts to reduce stereotype threat, uh, the, the 1,300 African-American student and the 1,400 uh, uh, white student performed the same. So that's a good indication that there was stereotype threat repressing that, sta that SAT test, and I believe there is a lot of cases, but. First of all, I'd like to thank you for your uh, presentation. And, um, and I have a question regarding the, the setup of the first, the, the, the example that you gave, the first example of uh, Ms. Elliott, uh, as well as the, some of the other um, experiments that you described. Um, you seem to focus on more, uh, a lot on, on stereotype, stereotype threat, but uh, within those descriptions that you, that you gave us, uh, there seems to be um, a, a source of power that creates a social construction, a social situation, a social um, uh, structure, in this case, blue eye, bl uh, brown eye. And that, uh, that uh, power right there is in, in itself the source of those distressing, uh, distresses, um, what you call distress components that eventually lead to the arousal of the frustration and stress that eventually lead to uh, underperformance. And I guess my question is uh, related to why are you using the, wo the word prejudice uh, to describe this arousal instead of discrimination? And, and if you were to be more in terms of, in terms of like confronting more the, the source, uh, in the case of the experiment, for instance, the, sources of the source of that distress is actually the experiment of who is setting up the, situ the situation. So I was wondering if you can comment on that. I uh, think I can track most of that. Um, the, because um, I, I, I have some sympathy, I think, with where you're, where you're going with that, that um, I, I, I'm not really talking about prejudice, so I guess that's one thing, one word you said, I, I wanna, wanna, wanna be real clear about that. Stereotype threat uh, happens in circumstance. You could take a wand to get all the prejudice out of the human condition, you'd still get stereotype threat effects because they're coming from the fact that I just know in my culture I could be perceived that way uh, based on a stereotype even though the, the person who's doing it or the people who's doing it, or, they don't want it. They could be pulling for me. In, in women in math uh, 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 courses, they could be pulling for me to succeed, but, but I, I just can't be sure that they're not seeing me through a stereotype. And, I, and this gets us into the nature of, uh, of, of prejudice and so on, and it would be, it would be a fun digression for me to do, but <laughs> maybe not so good for you guys at this hour. Uh, but I do think power is, is, a, is a, a factor. It does set up these things, and I think that experiment is a good example. She's setting up as the power figure there what the stigma is going to be, what the stereotype is going to be, and that's, that's driving the bus. So I, I agree in, in, entirely with that interpretation of it. Power is a factor here. Yeah, that, that too is a great insight in, into this. Um, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll start my answer to that question by saying I'm, I'm a dedicated integrationist. I think that's the only way forward for us. So, there. Now, uh, <laughs> having said that, uh, you have to acknowledge the, the data of maybe which your experience uh, is, is close to, which is that um, in the case of a lot of women who wind up in quantitatively based fields went to, went to single sex schools. And a lot of, uh, I think the statistic I, I've been citing is that about 65, 70% of African Americans who go into quantitatively based fields, engineering to being a physician, um, went to historically black 
uh, colleges, universities, which educate only 17% of the African-American college population. So they're, they're having a hugely disproportionate effect in producing people like you. Uh, so, uh, and th so that does tell you something, that when they're in that period of life where you're kind of bonding with a career path and with a, a major and so on, uh, being in a situation where probably these threats are less, are less, may be helpful. Uh, they just may be, uh, uh, you're not worrying about this vigilance, this perception is kind of out of your, out of your way, uh, and you're able to again relate to the material more open-heartedly and intellectually, and then if you, you get, you find it interesting and off you go. So, so it, it could be a factor. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, you, it goes on and on. The historically black colleges are not getting this, the African American students, for example, with the highest preparation. But, but uh, uh, so Stanford, to speak of my own school, uh, gets very strong uh, African American students dedicated to a medical career, and, and, but at the four years later, uh, sends very few of them off in that uh, direction. So there's a retraction, your guy, Yuri Treisman used to use this term, there's a retraction of ambition in, in there that, makes, that, that happens. And I can't help but to think some of these processes are, are a part of that. So, yes? That is a very good question, I talk about that. Um, for, for Sandra Day O'Connor on the Supreme Court, having Ruth Bader Ginsburg, one other, you know, just two people there, was critical mass. Uh, but uh, at Berkeley, you know, two, <laughs> two Latino students would not be critical mass. <laughs> uh, so somewhere in between there, there's something that uh, maybe somebody smarter than me could, could begin to quantify, but it's like pornography, you know it when you see it. I think it's more, Still in that status. <laughs> uh, my name's Leanne. I'm a philosophy major. Um, going back to the gentleman's question about ethnic studies, I wonder, uh, I worry about the effectiveness of this as a general educational requirement as I don't see how it would answer the problem. I see, I think personally for me, what had the, the most impact in my educational career was uh, an American history course that I took with Professor Einhorn here on campus where I saw and I was able to track the history of women and other minorities that I didn't know existed, that we had a place in that history. I wonder if maybe our approach should be incorporating more underrepresented peoples, like their stories in our history, in our science courses, et cetera. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I'm, not so, I'm, not, I'm sort of agnostic about how you do it, but I think those stories need to be taught to everybody. Uh, I, I think that sends a very different uh, signal, that those stories are important for everybody to know. They're important for me to know about my own group, but they're also important for everybody to know. So, I, so if you're an educated person, I think, you, I think you have to feel some obligation to know those things. And, and so, um, I, you know, I, I feel it's important not, not to be a course that's somehow not, not presented that way. It needs to be presented that way. So I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to end here. I think Professor Steele may stay around for a few informal questions, but thank you all very much, and thank you, Claude, for your time. Thank you. Thank you.